Stanford University. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special event commemorating the 100th anniversary of the birth of an uncommon man with an extraordinary set of causes, of a servant, a leader, and a legend in the public, the nonprofit, and the private sectors. And on this particular weekend of a fellow Stanford graduate, John W. Gardner. I'm Donna Michelle Anderson, and I was and always will be a John Gardner Public Service Fellow. I'm from the second year of the program, class of 86 here at Stanford. And uh, to say that I was inspired and moved by that experience is to underestimate the power of such an extraordinary man. Since 1985, when Stanford and Berkeley first launched this program, funding service mentorships in local and national and global environments. There have been 168 graduating seniors who have had the privilege of carrying on his name and his legacy. And I will admit at the age of 20, I didn't completely understand the scope of his history and his impact on our country and on the world. Because back then there was no Wikipedia, there was no Google. Uh, but I still to this day carry with me dog-eared copies of his books, of his essays. They inform me in my career now. And I think, oh my gosh, what exceptional reach he could have had today sharing his words of wisdom and those of others who inspired him. I like to think he might say, don't separate the men from the boys. This is John Gardner tweeting in my mind. Mm. <laughs> and then hire the boys. Hashtag bad leadership. <laughs> to Professor Gardner's family, Mrs. Gardner, his wife, Mrs. Trimble, his daughter, who could not be with us today, to his grandson, Gardner Trimble, that we're so happy and honored to have here. Please know how much he inspired us. And the power of this fellowship in continuing his life and his passion and his legacy with the lifelong servants and leaders that it continues to create. I know that my fellow fellows, his colleagues and friends here, our former advisors who, thank goodness, constantly advised those of us in the early years to meet with him, be mentored by him, are happy to also say that we are mentors in our own right now because of the foundation and the launch pad that this opportunity gave to us. I know everyone here is very excited for today's program, so please let me say thank you and happy birthday, John W. Gardner. And please now allow me to introduce today's moderator. It is Bob Joss, the Philip H. Knight Professor and Dean Emeritus of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Professor Joss. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Donna. It's a real treat for those of us on stage to talk about somebody who was so special, both in our lives personally, but in many, many walks of life throughout the country. You have the details on our panelists, I know, in your program and the materials. Just very quickly, so you know who's who and who's on first. From my far left, your right, Senator Tim Wirth, <laughs> uh, who is currently president of the United Nations Foundation, among many other things. Sitting next to Tim is, uh, is a Diana Aviv, who is president and CEO of the Independent Sector, something very dear to John. In the middle, the Honorable Bob, uh, <laughs> the Honorable Bob Edgar, former congressman and currently president and CEO of Common Cause. And next to him, we have uh, Mark Friedman, who is founder and CEO of Civic Ventures. And right on my immediate left, Milbury McLaughlin, the David Jacks Professor of Education Emeritus, and perhaps most importantly, the founding director of the John Gardner Center for Youth and Their Communities here at Stanford. So everybody here has a very special connection with John. 
I can tell you as the moderator that he was a great friend and a role model. We first met in 1968. Uh, I was young and idealistic, eager to have an impact on the world. He was then 55 and idealistic, and he was having a huge impact on American society at that time. Clearly, clearly somebody that I admired and modeled my life after. He was a, an inspirational national leader, but he was so humble and approachable. He was a gifted writer and teacher. Uh, and his writings on leadership and renewal always resonate so strongly with me as just about the very best work in a crowded field. When I came back to Stanford to be dean, John encouraged me to teach an MBA class on leadership, something that I started doing 12 years ago and continue with great satisfaction. In fact, just had a class yesterday. And I know I've learned as much about leadership from teaching it as from practicing it. I'm sure John understood this. And much of my teaching really draws on his writing and on his personal example. And he reminded me not that long ago in the start of my career that uh, the best leaders are incessantly teaching and the best teachers are leading. And in that spirit, what we thought we'd do today is uh, really reflect a bit on John Gardner, the teacher, because of the wonderful teaching he left behind. His writing was incredible. And some of his uh, phrases, his observations have been quoted forever and ever by many, many people. We thought we'd pick a phrase and then let our panelists take off on that as uh, they desire. But one of the things I think many of you have heard that John wrote was, you know, there are people in this world who just strengthen it just by being the kind of people they are. And uh, I think our panelists are no exception. And I want to ask each of them to just start by uh, how John really influenced and affected your life, made you the person you are today. So why don't we just start with Tim? Oh, happy. Well, Bob, thank you very much. And thank you all very much for coming, <clears throat> Gardner. It's good to see you. And Glad to have you here. See, we give our best to your mom and your grandmother. Uh, I was in the third class of White House Fellows. Bob was in about the fourth or fourth, fifth class, yeah, right? Yeah. And that was a program that Gardner had started, uh, or convinced Lyndon Johnson to start. And the idea was to create what he called a cadre of inners and outers. People who would get themselves engaged um, in the government, and then after learning a lot about it, which is what you always do, you know, and making a contribution, you would go home and become an outer and then presumably go, go back and forth. And that was the purpose of the fellows program. I had been at Stanford when I became a fellow. I was a graduate student here and uh, a friend of mine from Stanford uh, was in the first class of White House fellows. And um, I said, if he can get a White House fellow, I had to be able to get that was the only reason I knew anything about it was through the Stanford connection and Mike Walsh. Yeah. And I was very fortunate to be assigned uh, to Gardner. Anyway, what happened to me was that my career just took, I mean, it took a totally different, not angle, but it just moved out so much more broadly as a result of that experience that I wanted to be a university president, I thought, be involved in academia. And my world just broadened so significantly and he was the reason that that happened. So, I mean, I can, there are a lot of tales that go along with that, but you say, what kind of an impact did he have? Yeah. I mean, it was, had everything to do. I try to meet with the fellows every year, each class of White House fellows, and try to give them a sense of what we all, the privileges that you and I had, Bob. Thanks, Tim. Diana, how about you? Um, I had the opportunity to um, be connected with the independent sector in 2003 for the first time and knew that John Gardner had helped create, co-created independent sector with Brian O'Connell. And so for my first speech for the conference, I read every one of his books and lay, tried to lay my hands on everything. And what struck me about it was the degree to which everything he said continued to be relevant and inspiring and enabling me to think about how I was going to do the work going forward of carrying the legacy. I, I think for the first time I understood what the word legacy really means. 
in um, creating this, in writing about it, where what he created with the independent sector, which is the leadership forum of foundations, nonprofits, and corporate giving programs, reflecting the, um, the, the coming together of the sector on, on issues. And, but it wasn't just about institutions, or what was clear to me about John Gardner is that he cared about individuals, he thought society mattered, different parts of society mattered, and in a way it was almost as if I had a person in my ear all the time, on my shoulder, advising me on how I need to move forward. So he was my big security blanket. Bob. Well, I first um, got influenced by John Gardner when I met this guy. We were elected to the United States Congress at the first uh, November 1974. We were in that Watergate baby class, and uh, Tim was one of the leaders of that class. And obviously, John must have done a great job to produce uh, such a great leader, because all of us looked up to Tim. I, I met John Gardner, though, in 1995, and I'll tell a story that not very many people know. I applied for the job that I currently have in 1995. I was president at Claremont School of Theology. I had come to that position after leaving Congress and working on the Committee for National Security. I was five years into the presidency of a theological school, very progressive uh, academic theological school down in Claremont, California. And my wife uh, was not real happy with California and thought maybe we should move back east. So I applied to take Fred Wertheimer's place. Fred had been part of Common Cause for 17 years. I flew out to Washington, and I met one of my other heroes there, a guy by the name of Archibald Cox. Now, Archibald Cox had a great impact on me as well. At that time, he was chair of the board at Common Cause, but on October 20th, 1973, he was the special prosecutor looking in to the issue of Watergate. I was a chaplain at Drexel University, had never been to a political meeting, had never taken a political science course. This is November 1973. November 1974, I was a member of the United States Congress. Highest <laughs> office I held was being vice chairman of my son's parent-teachers organization. <laughs> but when I went to the search committee, I got to hug both Archibald Cox and John Gardner. I got to sit and listen to their questions. I got back on the plane and flew back to, Wash uh, to uh, California and called them up and said I was not interested in leaving California at the time. I stayed five additional years as president of graduate school. But five years ago, I became the president and CEO of Common Cause. We like to call ourselves the uncommon cause. And like uh, Diana, I read all of his books and all of his quotes. I love quotes. My favorite person to quote usually is Dr. Martin Luther King, who said, you and I will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. But I knew how good John Gardner was when I read this quote, an excellent plumber is infinitely more admirable than an incompetent philosopher. The society which scorns excellence in plumbing as a humble activity and tolerates shoddiness in philosophy because it's an exalted activity will have neither good plumbing nor good philosophy. <laughs> neither its pipes nor its theories will hold water. <laughs> I love John Gardner's it's one sense of, the greats, of humor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the greats. Mark Friedman, how about you? Well, I, I met John very late in his life. He was nearly... 80, and I always had a great admiration for him and, and for all the things he accomplished. And every time we'd get together, I would pepper him with questions about various phases of his life and how he managed to achieve all the things that he did. And he was very polite, um, put up with my questions, answered. But he, he constantly tried to change the subject because he was really more interested in the future than he was in even celebrating the past, and it dawned on me over time that he was more interested in a future that he wouldn't even see. Um, he, was, he had left this great legacy, but he was more interested in, in living a legacy than just leaving one. And when you think about the organizations that we all represent, we're part of, it, of his legacy, but there's, there's such a broader spectrum of individuals who in various ways were shaped by John, most of the whom we don't even 
know about, and that continues to resonate generation after generation. And so I, I, I had the privilege, though, of working with him on a particular project initially, the Experience Corps, which was a national service program helping mobilize other people in the second half of life to work one-on-one -on -one with children to essentially live their own legacy. And, and that, that was a powerful lesson to me. John always said, you know, it's better to be interested than to be interesting. And I, I keep hearing that voice on my shoulder and thinking about how we can be interested in this next generation. Thank you, and Melbourne. Wow. I think I'm like Diana. I have John on my, in my ear. And yeah. um, his influence on me really is seen in the John W. Gardner Center for Youth and Their Communities and what it represents. And John and I spent a lot of time talking about the roles of government, he would call it government. Um, and I really didn't understand for the longest time his view on the role of federal state policy and local. I had come to Stanford from the Rand Corporation and so had very much national federal policy in my, in my sights. And John would again and again emphasize the power of the grassroots, or in John's words, the grassroots, um, and would say, no, this is, this is democracy devolves. Um, this is where the fabric of society is, is woven, and this is where democracy is played out um, in the power of the grassroots. And that the, the investment really is in generating community from the ground up, and it's not the role of government to uh, direct it from above. So that was one of just really understanding what I've come to call the local advantage and how government and power at the local level is very different than it is at the state and federal levels or global levels. It's a different issue, different resources. The second lesson John taught me was um, think about the broad investment when it comes to youth. He was very committed to youth and to young people and saw them as really the resource for community building. But he said, you've got to go beyond those institutional boundaries. It's not about schools, and it's not about health, and it's not about little silos that have youth moving through them. And the role of a Gardner Center, the role of youth policy, really is to look across those institutional, institutional boundaries. And the third point, um, the third lesson that John taught me didn't take hard to learn, um, much time to learn. It was about the role of a university and especially a university like Stanford, he really felt deeply that there was a moral responsibility that a Stanford had to the community. And he felt it needed to be a reciprocity and a partnership, not an unequal power relationship. Um, this is what the Gardner Center is about, really, is this kind of reciprocal, mutual partnership with local communities. I really think, Gardner, your grandfather wouldn't have gotten very excited about a John Gardner Center for Research <laughs> on communities or on youth, but he was very enthusiastic and supportive about youth and their communities in this embedded, embedded sense. You heard so many people talk about the words in their ear, practically, and a wonderful quote from Bob about excellence in plumbing as well as philosophy. And excellence was a topic that John cared a lot about. In fact, he wrote a book, Excellence. Excellence is doing ordinary things extraordinarily well, he said. So let me pose to a few of our panelists. Mark, start with you, Bob, Tim. You know, as a leader, how do you encourage and inspire excellence in young people? Well, I, um, I got to know John, as I was saying earlier, when he was in the second half of life, and um, he inspired me to think about the question of excellence in that part of life. And one of the shocking realizations is that he'd won the Presidential Medal of Freedom in the early 1960s, and that's the gold watch. That's the ultimate um, <laughs> uh, send off. And yet, virtually everything he accomplished from White House fellows through Common Cause, independent sector, everything that he's remembered for today was accomplished after he received his gold watch. And I think he embodied and espoused that excellence knows no age boundary. And I, uh, I really f I feel like that's a lesson that's as powerful now and, uh, as it ever was. Wow. Well, I'm a, I'm a preacher. And um, churches have lots of sermons on Sunday morning. And the thing that I see in the life of someone like John Gardner is that along with courage, the willingness to risk, he preached a lot of nonverbal sermons. And it was his life. Uh, it was who he was. It was the texture of his, of his character 
that had folks following him and, and being guided by him. So I think there's a, an element of leadership that doesn't have to be always verbal. I mean, you should read his books, and you know they're all still relevant today. But it's the picture and the image. I have five honorary doctorate degrees, but I'm equally proud of my five arrests for civil disobedience. If I have one regret in my life, it's that I've not been arrested enough. Um, I, I offer that for you uh, if you get challenged. Faithful civil disobedience, I think, is, is important. But it's the kind of symbolic courage of John Gardner that uh, gives me passion. And you know, I don't know of anybody else who founded civic ventures and independent sector and common cause and planted so many seeds in so many people by just the kind of person he was. Tim, excellent. We, you know, we, we may uh, come back to this and sort of the state of the nation today. Here we are in 2012. Probably everybody in this room has, within the last 48 hours, had a conversation about where the country's headed. And is something wrong? And are we, you know, on, where's the rudder? Uh, Gardner had such an abiding faith uh, in the power of a democracy and the responsibilities that people had to be citizens. And that was the excellence. You know, that we all had a, you didn't have to be a senator or the dean of a, of a school or the head of common cause or whatever. It was your responsibility and the civic institutions that surrounded you. And that's what we all shared. And it would be interesting to think about this, I think, and sort of what does that mean to us today? It was a real beacon and a, it's a real cre de cœur in a way about where we are today. You know, sort of think about what do we learn from what happened um, in the last, I don't know, whatever it is, last 15 or 20 years, and what would he say about it? What would the guy on your shoulder say about this? I think you'll find that haunts all of us on the stage here. What's that guy on the shoulder saying about today, and what are we doing to make it better? One of the themes John wrote about a lot, and I've spent a lot of time going through and through as leadership. Uh, uh, we actually are joined now in absentia by uh, one of our panelists who couldn't make it, but a, a great favorite of John's, and she it was a huge admirer of his, and that, that's uh, Jacqueline Novogratz, who's a graduate of our school and is the CEO of Acumen Fund. She had a board meeting in India, but she wanted to join us for just two minutes and say something, so Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Well, when I think about leadership, I realize that one of the luckiest things in my life was getting to know a wonderful man named John Gardner, who was the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare for President Johnson. And he was walking integrity. John would say, what's most important in the world is to be interested rather than to be interesting. And he said that we are surrounded by um, great opportunities that are just disguised as insoluble problems. He lives inside of me every day, and I think that what John probably understood more than anyone I've ever met is that true legacy comes from investing in people and in believing in others and letting their le leadership soar. And though he hasn't been with us for 10 years, I can see his spirit living through not only people in my generation and the generation above, but the generation that we then are influencing because of the gift that John gave us. And that ultimately is the true legacy of leadership. Thank you, Jacqueline. He lives inside of me every day. That's pretty remarkable. So leadership. Let me ask Diana, Milbury, Bob. You know, if you want to develop, John said this, if you want to develop leaders, you have to start young. How do we cultivate that next generation of leaders? Well, just before I get to that very particular question, I would say the fact that he thought that this was a major priority speaks volumes to who he was and what legacy he left for the rest of us. Because even as we all attend to our daily tasks, our obligation as leaders of organizations is also to focus on the future and to prepare, help, and participate in preparing leaders for the future. 
In preparation for this today, I went back to see what he said about what were the essential qualities of leadership. And I'll just remind you of the six qualities that he identified just very briefly. He said that great leaders think long term, longer term, uh, that they grasp that in thinking about where they are heading, they grasp the relationship to, of whatever it is that they're doing to the larger realities that are around them. There isn't a narrow focus, but there's a broader focus. There's a contextual focus. That they reach and influence constituents beyond their jurisdiction and beyond their boundaries. That they put a heavy emphasis on the intangibles of vision, of values, of motivation. And they understand intuitively the non-rational and unconscious elements in leader-constituent interaction. That they have the political skill to cope with conflicting requirements of multiple constituencies. And they think in terms of renewal. And that in that thinking of, uh, in terms of renewal, I think is an answer to, to your question. Um, as I thought about what that meant for me, or how he might have thought of that, to me it's not immediately obvious that this would only be about the, the millennial generation, the generation between the ages of, uh, I think it's about 12, almost teenagers and, um, and about 30. But it's also about leaders who are in the generation now poised to take over organizations. And what kind of responsibility we have now to help prepare and to work with our partners in what is known as the X generation, uh, that group of leaders who are poised, either they've created their own organizations or they are within our own, and what kinds of responsibilities we have. And um, I think that, I won't go into it in detail, but the kind of challenges that we face in working with the millennial generation are quite distinctive than having worked with any other generation. We know lots and lots of, um, about them. Uh, the fact that they are more passionate than people in the X generation, uh, that they are particularly interested in expressing their passion through their work, but their work isn't necessarily going to be in the charitable sector. Uh, as part of an NGO, that they might just as easily do that through business or government, that their loyalty is to the idea, not to the organization. And I think that that places a burden on us to think about how we do things differently so that the work that we do, so that the missions we accomplish continue regardless of the structures that he helped create and that we've continued to create ourselves. Hilbury, you are surrounded in much of your career with young people, and how do we cultivate that mm. next generation of leaders? Well, it's probably not surprising that one of the first initiatives of the John W. Gardner Center was a youth-led research effort. Um, embodying um, John's values about kind of tapping youth, um, engaging them in community, focusing on civic engagement. Um, the, it was called Yale, it's still called Yale, Youth Engaged in Leadership and Learning. And it provided the skills and support and opportunities for young people in the community, our community partners, to take an active role in their schools and their communities, to really um, be a leader and learn how to be a leader. And when we started this, John said, well, you're going to be raising up a bunch of responsibles. He <laughs> called the, the youth are also some of the responsibles. And he said, I can tell you where your greatest problem is going to sit. It's with the adults. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, in fact, with the adults, um, kind of learning to trust young people, kind of having the time and the resources for young people, changing the culture of who's in charge, who's in charge here, especially starting early in the, in the early middle school grades. Um, but so our response, the Gardner Center's response to cultivating leadership among youth really is through a very intentional, skill-based, um, supported program of youth-led research. Bob, you have a thought here? No, the uh, program you are part of uh, is very important. I want to give a shout out to uh, Diana because I served on her board. In fact, I was on her search committee uh, when we found her up in New York and brought her to independent sector. And we never quite understood the, how great she'd be as a leader of independent sector. But one of the things that she has done is every year at the annual meeting, she honors a whole host of young millennials, uh, new emerging leaders, uh, people uh, at least 40 and under, probably 30 and under. Uh, and I think that is a very positive way to help uh, 
inspire people, giving them uh, some kudos very early. Um, I do something at uh, almost every speech. I'm going to do it with you guys. And uh, my staff often start to cringe when I do it. But let me ask you uh, to chant with me. We are. We are. We are. We are. We are. We are. The leaders. The leaders. We have been waiting for. We have been waiting for. I spent 12 years in ministry and 12 years in Congress and was in academia and was running the National Council of Churches. And often we look to the White House or House and Senate for leadership, but I think John Gardner understood that each of us have to be the courageous leaders that we've been waiting for. And I just want to say, if you take the time on a Saturday afternoon to come to a forum like this and miss the football game, <laughs> um, that, that you are the leaders we've been waiting for. And we ought not to just talk about the youth Fastest growing age group by percentage of population are those over the age of 100 by percentage of population. <laughs> and the next fastest sure. are those over the age of 85. Cool. I have uh, an 88-year-old mother who just picked up a 57-year-old boyfriend. Um, <laughs> I, I think we don't do enough um, to recognize, and, and John Gardner clearly understood this, People don't want to play golf for the rest of their lives. They don't want to uh, go fishing for the rest of their lives. They want to be engaged. So getting some of the young people and some of the older adults, and I, I was brought home to this when um, I went to visit my mother. And um, she never graduated from high school, but she got her GED at about 60 years of age. Uh, now at 87, 88, she asked me to take her over to the local school. and. I didn't know what she was doing over at the elementary school. She was delivering a book to a young girl that she's been reading to, uh, who had come next door to the senior center, and they became friends. There's so much that we could do, and I think that's in the John Gardner legacy. Moving from leadership and excellence, I want to talk for a minute about renewal. It was one of John's favorite topics. He wrote a wonderful book called Self-Renewal, but he also was incredibly and always curious. Why is it some people, some institutions, continually improve, renew, get better, and some just sort of stop? And it was a, a favorite topic of his. Uh, let me pose to Milbury, maybe Mark, Tim. Here's John's, one of his quotes. In the ever-renewing society, is a framework within which continuous innovation, renewal, and rebirth can occur. So he loved ever-renewing societies. But how do you and your organizations embrace and benefit from some of John's thoughts about renewal? I think I read that book about once a month. Yeah, that's a great. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Gardner Center really is, is based on the assumption that youth development requires community development. And that community development, um, in the renewal sense that John talked about, requires new voices and new perspectives and new policies. So not same old, same old uh, repackage, as you were saying. So renewal, in that sense, really is at the heart of the John Gardner Center. And just taking up the whole idea of, of new perspectives, um, we have a program called the Youth Data Archive that um, leaps across institutional boundaries to combine data from um, many youth-serving agencies, education, of course, but also health, um, community-based organizations, and such. And this is so cool, because what you can see when these data are combined is a broad view, as John would have uh, advised us, of really a community's investment in youth. So that's really a, a different perspective. And I think each one of our youth data archive projects has resulted in an aha for participating uh, institutions, because they're seeing for the first time a view of youth in the community they've never been able to see before um, because of that. Um, new voices. I talked a bit about the, the role of young people um, supported through the Gardner Center. Another set of new voices that I would point to as part of the Gardner Center's activity is the role of the NGOs and the CBOs in community, really kind of bringing, bringing them together. Um, the Gardner Center had an initiative called Community Youth Development that brought, I see Pat Brown, it was at over 100 of the 
youth serving organizations in Redwood City together to have conversations um, they'd never had before. And out of this, in a, in a renewal, renewal philosophy and stance, came a number of new policies and practices um, based on these new voices and these new perspectives. Um, Redwood City now is all about community schools, for example. Um, San Francisco School District and City College are now talking to each other rather than pointing fingers at each other. Um, the health, health area is now really interested in what they have to do about chronic absenteeism. Could it be something that the health, health sector is worried about? So renewal is part of all of this, and it's about um, new conversations and, and new voices. Well, Milbury talked about reading self-renewal every month, I, and um, I remember, a you know, we're talking a lot about the lessons John had to impart and his insights, but there was also all the practical help he provided. I, and he took us to see an investor who made the first grant that started our organization, and it was a nighttime meeting, and we were driving home on 101 from San Mateo back to Stanford, and it, I was once again asking him about his past and his life and what he felt like his greatest contribution to the world was, and he said it was that book. And I was so engrossed in, in this um, question and answer that I um, neglected to realize that there was a, a sea of red taillights accumulating directly in front of our <laughs> Volkswagen Beetle with John shoehorned into the passenger seat. And uh, I slammed on the brakes, and he had his, uh, his hands affixed to the dashboard. And he was uh, reciting a quote that nobody ever attributes to him. It's the quote, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and the quote that was playing in my head was, I'm killing a national treasure. <laughs> but fortunately, I think that adage about your whole life flashing before your eyes is really true. There were so many things to flash, we had enough time to actually stop the car. He never drove with me again. He wouldn't even walk on the same side of the street. <laughs> um, but I mean, more substantively, I think you know he was a great exhorter and a, and a motivator and inspirer through his writing. And he talked about how we were we made those we were prisoners of the jails that we created. But he also really believed in society and social institutions. It wasn't just an individual imperative to renew that we needed a self-renewing society. And I think it, you know in our work we've been trying to create sort of pathways to purpose to help people who want to move in that direction of renewal, go from aspiration to action. Yep. My hunch is that renewal may turn out to be a very good idea and a very good word for describing where we are today in 2012. It doesn't have a pejorative to it. It doesn't have a finger pointing nature to it. It's a very, very constructive idea. And you know, a number of people, and again, probably many of you are involved in this thinking, so how do we link together the hundreds of thousands of Americans, I mean, millions of Americans who are really asking about the renewal of this society? You know, what, are, what can we do? Where are we? How do we, uh, how do we think this through? And it's not going to be done from the top down. I mean, Gardner said that over and over again. Our society doesn't change because people in Washington decide that X, Y, and Z is going to happen. It comes from the bottom up. You know, civil rights happened that way, and the environment happened that way, and you know, women's issues came to the fore, not because there were a few senators who decided to do it, but it was all, it came from the grass roots. Grass right? roots. Grass roots. <laughs> that was his pronunciation, the grass roots. So how do we think about renewal and the grass roots? I mean, I think it's a very, very real challenge. And it's a, you know, there are guideposts in the book, but it's the idea of renewal, the idea of being unthreatened by your understanding that something isn't working, your understanding that change has to come about, that it's not going to come about unless you listen carefully to what somebody else is saying about this, which we don't do well enough. That's part of renewal. And it's part also of respecting our leaders. I think one, I, I love this, let me read, everybody's full of Gardner quotes, but uh, we tolerate mediocrity in our leaders and then exhibit contempt for them. Well, we do, you know, and it comes back, a lot of that comes right back to, you know, who are we, what do we think about our society, and what are we willing to do to be part of a national discussion about our need for self-renewal? About a year ago, out of the blue, a, a gentleman contacted me from Japan. 
Uh, and he had read self-renewal, and he was so excited. He said, this must be translated into the Japanese, and I'm getting it done. And would you write the foreword to this? He, he wanted to find somebody that knew John. And of course, I said, I'd be privileged to and delighted. Uh, and it's out there for those of you who need the Japanese version of <laughs> self-renewal. But it, mm -hmm. it does say something about John's impact in that he focused much, almost all of his writing on America. But it has a resonance around the world that's pretty powerful. And if ever there's a society that's grappling with renewal today, it is Japan. And it, it got me thinking about another of John's topics, which was community. I mean, he wrote a lot about community, and you see some of the, uh, uh, the consequences of his thinking and writing in the institutions on the, on the stage here, how much he cared about community. He said, communities are where the fabric of our society is being rewoven. It's at the community level. But it raises the interesting question of, you know, what's community in the context of a global society? where people in Japan are wrestling with those questions as well. And so let me ask Tim, you have a very global organization, then maybe Diana and Milbury, just you know, what, what about community in the context of a global society? Well, we're obviously going through a huge amount of redefinition right now uh, in a number of ways. I think uh, the obvious is the telecommunications one, and we're all going to say that. You know? But I think... Uh, Maybe more important is the fact there's a kind of great leveling going on in the world, and uh, that is a very fair phenomenon. You know, they're not no longer no country is going to be able to tell everybody else what to do. And country, there's a lot of emergence of new ideas and and new powers around the world, and that is all, you know, a terribly important part of this global community. Now, is our political leadership going to how are they going to come to understand this? Democracy and the idea of community, which are really linked and were very closely linked in Gardner's mind. Democracy, you know, is not about just holding elections. Democracy is about building and creating all of these institutions of civil society, you know, that are the school boards and the churches and the parent groups and all, all of that fabric of self-government, you know, that makes community work. And that's what's going to hold our world together, is that sense of understanding of that kind of fabric of common interest. That fam and that's what community means, common interest. You know, what is our common interest? You know, we, are, we have a danger, I think. There's a polarizing danger of these enormous polarities. There's enormous um, distinctions between rich and poor, between countries and individuals and so on that is... I think exceedingly dangerous for us, but that, you know, we want to, how do we handle that? Not pointing a finger at that, but going back, as we go back to the idea of renewal, he had a genius for words. Go back to renewal and self-renewal, go back to community. You know, these are words that can knit people together and don't polarize them. When you talk, when you use that kind of a word, people can say, yeah, I want to, I want to be involved in that. I want to be part of that. And that's what, you know, we have to do that right here in our own backyard, obviously, and the world's trying to figure out how to do that as well. You know, in some ways, this is one of the great challenges of our times, how to redefine community, precisely because of the point you started with, Tim, of uh, technology. Um, John Gardner didn't have the benefit, as did any of us 25 years ago and before that, of knowing how profound the revolution of technology would be to redefining community. The fact that we have, via the internet, communities interested in, forgive me, dahlias, a, a community that might be interested um, in a common subject area, focused on that and connecting in ways that will render their lives meaningful that it's not defined by boundaries, even as it's profoundly local, but to them it's very personal, so that local and personal have become mixed up in ways uh, that are very different. But even as the world has gotten smaller because of technology on the one side, we've also become increasingly tribalized. And I think that one of the challenges that we face is how do we remain open and um, available to the influences of the benefits 
of learning about others and not threatened by it so that we have to close ourselves off in ways that matter. I think it's not insignificant that, uh, that there is a rejuvenation of cities around the nation and around the world uh, in ways in which people are coming back and wanting to connect with one another in different kinds of ways. I only hope that they get to Detroit soon. But, <laughs> but that said, that, um, that I, I was just reading that, that uh, just after decades of decline, America's downtowns are once again attracting new residents, not just workers and shoppers, but in many of the largest cities, the most populous metropolitan areas, downtown have been growing since 2000 in double digit numbers. So that while we're part of a global community, I think that there's an opportunity now to be part of a local community. And John Gardner's words, even though they preceded this major change in our world about what is global and what is local and how we connect them, they're as relevant today as they always were. John's on my shoulder right now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and what, this is one of my favorite phrases of his, wholeness embracing diversity. That's the deal, he would say. That's the deal for the responsibles, is to have, at the community level, kind of have a wholeness and a fullness that embraces the diversity that exists there that's both institutional and cultural. And I think that would be his response, Tim and Diana, to your, your global question. Bob, if I could add just a word yeah, about please. this. Uh, uh, two words, actually. Uh, I want to add to the word renewal uh, something I think John Gardner would appreciate, and that is, uh, I think we need ego disarmament as well as renewal. <laughs> uh, often, you know, when I was head of the National Council of Churches, all the churches wanted to end poverty, but only if they got credit for it. And I think uh, institutions have egos, and John was helpful breaking through. But back on the word of community, John had some of the same spirit that Dr. Martin Luther King had. 1967, Dr. King wrote a book and the title of the book is, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? And the last paragraph of that book is instructive. I met Dr. King just five weeks before he was assassinated. And Dr. King said this. He said, we're now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us bare, naked, and dejected with lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of humanity does not remain at the flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. Dr. King ends that by saying, we still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. This may well be humankind's last chance to choose between chaos and community. I think people like Dr. King and John Gardner are reminding us of the urgency of now, the importance of what Tim said, bottom-up leadership that moves from the bottom up. And uh, it's not too late. And I would also, I think John Gardner was uh, a secular evangelist for renewal. But uh, John also understood that it, we don't have to sit around and wait for a prophet from on high. We have to recognize that we are each called to make a difference on, on planet Earth. And uh, John inspired us to do that. I hope that one of the future visions of many of us will be how do we inspire others to recognize that we are, in fact, the leaders we've been waiting for. And indeed, I think. The thing in common with the panelists here is that all of us, in one way or another, spend an awful lot of our time trying to figure out how can we somehow transmit that Gardner sense of community and uh, excellence and the building of community that is our responsibility. That He said, that's your responsibility. If, if you don't stand up, who will? And, uh, all of us in our institutions try to engender that in the young people of today. I think another common thing about John was this incredible optimism. He was an amazing optimist all his life. And uh, in fact, one of the things he had to say about leadership was that you know, it's incredibly important for leaders to be optimistic. Leaders keep hope alive was one of his great phrases. 
And he did not like people who weren't optimistic, <laughs> cynics. You know, He said, the cynic says, one man can't do anything. I say, only one man can do anything. <laughs> only one man can do anything. So he was, you know, it's up to you. It's up to each individual. And, uh, but cynicism is out there. So why should we be hopeful, panelists? That's, uh, that's the question. Let me start with, include all of you who want to be. Let me start with Bob. Why should we be hopeful? I asked, uh, when Tim and I were in Congress, we had a congressional clearinghouse on the future, and we invited uh, Jonas Salk to come and be one of the speakers. And he was looking at the old world view versus the new world view, very complicated theory. He's the guy who invented the polio vaccine. And um, we asked him a question, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And he said, oh, I'm an optimist. He says, it's too easy to be a pessimist. You just go home and wait for the sky to fall. He said, I wake up every morning saying, what can I do to make a difference? He reminds me a little bit of um, Bobby Kennedy when, in 1966, he went to look at a, apartheid in South Africa and could have been super cynical. But he came away and he said, let no one be discouraged by the belief that there's nothing that one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery and ignorance, injustice or violence. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events so that in the total of all those acts will be written the history of our generation. I, I would just say John Gardner was an optimist, but he also was a realist. And uh, he had the balance between optimism and, and realism. And uh, that's one of the things we've got to learn. And how do you wake up every morning and say, what can I do to improve the quality of life on planet Earth? I think he even said hard-headed optimism. He, yes. he liked that. <laughs> Tim, what do you No, I was going to say, Bob hit the right balance, I think, in thinking about it. So there's a mindless optimism, and then people aren't really thinking about it. Oh, I'm an optimist, and everything's going to be all right. I therefore am absolved of responsibility. And that exists. Uh, it does have to be a very hard-headed kind of optimism and a, and a, real, and a realism. Um, part of Gardner's realism was his understanding of, again, I come out of a political world for most of my life, but his understanding and respect for politics. You may know, I've never heard this, Gardner, but uh, when, when I was my first congressional race, I was well behind, Bob and I both had that experience, <laughs> I was well behind and your grandfather happened to be flying through Denver and he came out to see us. And we sat on my front porch and we had a little hit rise and you could look all the way down the front range. And I'll never forget sitting there, I never knew that, Jack, that he drank bourbon and we consumed a significant amount of Jack Daniels that night, which I, was a surprise to me. You know, I didn't know that that was what, that, you, that John Gardner did. I, mean, I did. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, so, uh, but as we got rolling, he then started to talk about politics, and then he turned to me and he said, "You know, the one biggest regret I have is that I never ran for public office." which I thought was really interesting. I don't know if he, if he ever said that to anybody else. Maybe this was a moment. I've never seen it written or whatever that he did do that. But he had this intense respect you know, for the reality of politics and how do you make it work. That's the hard-headed nature, intense respect for that. And that was so important. I mean, it was a great evening for me. I mean, I, I, I came, I was reinvigorated. Uh, in, a, in a way that made a tremendous amount of difference to the rest of my life because of that evening. I always remember it. But it was that, that hard-headed reality about the world in which we live and how do we organize ourselves to get from here to there. You just got to work it, and you got to work it, and you got to work it. Right? Keep your eye on the ball, but there's a reality to how hard it is. It is really hard, and you can rejoice in that too. That's great. I, I, I can see him saying that. I never read it or heard it, but I can definitely see him saying it. Yeah. Mark? I lift my glass to that comment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just hearing you talk, I, I was thinking of a conversation last night with Gardner Trimble. He told me that in John's last year when he was ill and getting through the day was increasingly difficult, uh, but he was still trying to go to the office every day, that 
pasted up on the wall, he had a, a scrap of paper and he had cut out the edges of it, um, put some scotch tape up on the wall, and there was a single word on that scrap of paper and it was the word purpose. And I think that through every one of his endeavors, even when things look bleak, you know, breathtaking opportunities out of insoluble problems, he always had that North Star, that sense of purpose, and it carried him on. Diana, any thoughts? As you're talking, the thought that comes to mind is that what he inspires is us to think about what should and must be, and therefore what can be. And that if, in fact, we approach problems as insoluble ones and insurmountable ones, and we spend a huge amount of time looking at why it can't be done, then we'll never get anywhere. And that journey of any thousand miles begins with the first step and then another one and another one. And his inspiring vision, but his realistic stance, I think makes it possible for all of us to do what we need to. And when you look back, we actually have made progress. That doesn't mean there isn't a lot more to do, but we have accomplished something and we should celebrate our accomplishments, not just our omissions. We talked about renewal, and uh, John, as we said, uh, wrote about personal renewal as well as institutional renewal. This, you know, I think he had a strong sense that, as, as many leadership scholars do, that, that leaders just have this incessant desire to see things done better, to see it improve, to see it change for the better. And uh, of course, he felt that way about each of us as individuals, that uh, that's what made life purposeful. Um, so he encouraged people on personal renewal to take stock of things, you know, of how they're going, and not, not, to, not stop yourself from growing and developing whatever age you are. And it, but he did have some wonderful words of advice at that. He said, look, when you're doing that, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be too hard on yourself. After all, life is the art of drawing without an eraser, he said. And I thought we might sort of wrap up by asking our panelists if, you know, any last word, Gardner quote, things that spring to mind, whatever, whatever you want. Uh, we'll just go down the line. Melbury? Well, my favorite quote has, um, it's been used in the Gardner Center brochures and it's been mentioned by at least three of us, but it's uh, John's comment that what we have before us are some breathtaking opportunities disguised as insoluble problems. And his perspective mattered so much. And I think since I work in the area of education, which has not been known to be problem free, um, and maybe even some insoluble problems, just to have that perspective that it's a question of um, seeing it as an opportunity, seeing it as a, a challenge of renewal, um, has certainly been my North Star. The, the, the last time I heard John speak, it was to a group of people uh, in the second half of life, and he, uh, he addressed them as youngsters. And he said, all of you people out there in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, I, uh, I wish for you a long youthfulness of spirit. And um, everybody got up and cheered. <laughs> when you guys are thinking about uh, this presidential election, and ask yourself, uh, what would John Gardner say at this moment in history? He actually said it. Here are some words. Um, I have someone who's going to be passing these out to you. I have a speech by Bill Moyers about John Gardner and uh, some reflections from David Cohen, who uh, worked for many years for, uh, for John. But at the back of uh, Bill Moyers' uh, speech to the 40th anniversary of Common Cause, he pulled out a quote that I haven't seen very often, but it's helpful in this presidential year. He said this, we are treading the edge of a precipice here. There is a disconnection between the people and their leaders. Citizens do not trust their government, and a variety of polls indicate that this mistrust extends to corporations and the media. People do not feel they have much control of their lives, and the sense of impotence grows like a great life-endangering tumor. Civilizations die of disenchantment. If enough people doubt their society, the whole venture falls apart. We must never let anger, 
fashionable cynicism or political partisanship blur our vision of this point, we must not despair of the republic. Well, it's interesting that you just said that, given what I chose. Uh, for my opening speech when I first joined Independent Sector, I told you I had read all of his books, and I was wondering which one I was going to quote. Uh, given the fact that I come from South Africa and spent a lot of time working on anti-apartheid issues at the time, um, this was the one that came to mind that I said in my first um, keynote speech at Independent Sector. It is we who must help lead our nation to an understanding that our differences and distinctions are a source of strength, and that for all the problems and challenges we encounter along the way, our diversity makes us stronger and connects us to the world outside through family, community, shared culture, and shared values. There are new places to be set at the American table. And when we have gathered around the table to act in concert, to raise our voices on behalf of the values and concerns we share, we may be sure that we will be heard. We will be heard because of who we are and because of how we are. We'll, we will be heard because of the moral strength that is ours. For us, philanthropy, the love of humankind, is not merely an attitude, it is both a conviction and an action. Well, we're obviously at a, we're all thinking we're, what, 30 days from an election, something like that. So that's going to be, you know, a very important watershed in every way. And it, the contrast, so I'm sitting here thinking to myself, the contrast between this discussion and so what I've largely heard in the last year and a half of the election is pretty stark. You know, so what are we going to do about that? I'm here, I'm thinking, gee, am I going to close with some eloquent gardenerism? No. You know, I've got one down here, but I'll not share of it. <laughs> but rather to say, you know, what is, this, what is this disconnect that we find ourselves? We're all motivated by this vision and this spirit, and you all wouldn't be here if you weren't, and you can't help but do be so motivated as an American. But what is that disconnect, and how do we begin to bridge that gap somehow? How, where, how do we get to contribute to a self-renewal? I think that's a serious question for Stanford, for example. I think that's a serious issue for this institution of enormous power and prestige and capacity and so on to think about. You know, I'm an, I was, anyway, I, I think all of our institutions have that to think about as well. And much of that gets lost. But each of us can push for that sort of self-renewal as we understand that we have to do it ourselves in our own lives and the way in which we approach it. Our institutions have to do that too so that we can heal the country. Very well spoken, Tim. Thank you. Uh, John loved to say, and he reminded me often, leaders find the words. You try some words, they might resonate, they might connect. If not, find some other words. And it's no accident that these quotable quotes keep ringing in all of our ears, because John took the time very carefully. He found the words. He had an incredible gift for finding the words that, that would really move us. Uh, one of the things he left me with, which I leave my students with in leadership, is he said, remember, Bob, leadership is not a science. It's an art. And in particular, it's a performing art. And you as leader, and each of you as leader, is the instrument. So you've got to know that instrument to play it well. And I think... You will agree with me that these instruments, my fellow musicians on stage here, uh, have all been playing their instrument as well as they could in the spirit of John Gardner. And uh, he does sit on our shoulder, as many of your shoulders. But please join me in thanking our panel, the School of Education, Dean Steele, Bob, thank you, thank you for coming. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.